Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arawa, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 270 of our pharmacotherapy series which majors in skin and soft tissue infections. The first question reads, NDP, a 25-year-old woman, presents to her family doctor with a two- to three-day history of worsening pain, redness, and swelling on her left leg after an abrasion that occurred after falling while jogging in the park. The area is red, painful, non-purulent, and warm to the touch. During the past 24 to 36 hours, the leg has become increasingly painful and tight. NDP denies having fever or chills. The presumptive diagnosis is a mild cellulitis, and dicloxacillin is prescribed. Why is dicloxacillin appropriate empiric treatment for NDP? Oral dicloxacillin is appropriate empiric therapy for cellulitis in an otherwise healthy individual with no signs or symptoms of systemic infection, regardless of presence of purulence. Dicloxacillin has predictable activity against streptococcus and methicillin-sensitive staphylococcus organisms and is better tolerated than erythromycin or clindamycin. Because the patient presents with non-purulent cellulitis, penicillin VK is also an option, however, it lacks coverage against staphylococcus. If the cellulitis is well demarcated and non-purulent, penicillin alone can be appropriate because the causative organism is likely to be streptococcus. Many other available antibiotics that have activity against Staphylococcus and Streptococcus organisms have been evaluated for effectiveness in skin and soft tissue infections. A recent review concluded that the available evidence does not allow specific recommendations for the best antibiotic regimen for cellulitis. Cephalexin is probably as effective and as well tolerated as dicloxacillin and is comparable in cost. However, the gram-negative activity of cephalexin, not present with dicloxacillin, is not required for most cases of cellulitis in otherwise healthy patients. In this case, antibiotic treatment is required, and NDP can receive dicloxacillin or cephalexin. In geographic areas where the incidence of community-acquired MRSA has become clinically important, accounting for more than 10% of isolates, particularly with additional risk factors children, competitive athletes, prisoners, soldiers, selected ethnic populations, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Pacific Islanders, IV drug users, men who have sex with men, empiric treatment should include antibiotics with activity against community acquired MRSA. In cases in which there is an abscess without signs of systemic infection, drainage is often all that is needed because antibiotic therapy has been shown to be no better than placebo for uncomplicated skin abscesses in a population at risk for community acquired MRSA infection. At present, most community acquired MRSA are still susceptible to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, clindamycin, and doxycycline. 
Although trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole has good activity against Staphylococcus aureus, its activity against Streptococcus pyogenes, that is group A, Streptococcus, is weak, making this antibiotic undesirable alone as empiric therapy. If these agents are used, a reasonable suggestion would be to re-evaluate by the patient if they are competent within 24 to 48 hours to verify that an improvement is occurring. Some clinicians avoid the use of clindamycin because of concerns of inducible resistance. In areas with a clinically important incidence of community-acquired MRSA, laboratories should test for inducible clindamycin resistance. If NDP is from an area of high community-acquired MRSA prevalence and has associated risk factors, the combination of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or doxycycline with beta-lactam, such as penicillin, cephalexin, or amoxicillin would provide therapy for the anticipated pathogens. However, even in areas of high community-acquired MRSA prevalence, some investigations have found cephalexin to be as effective as therapy specifically targeted for community-acquired MRSA, although this has not been supported in all studies. If community-acquired MRSA does not require antibacterial coverage, this practice may reduce antibacterial selection pressure and expense. The next question reads, what agents could be chosen if NDP is allergic to penicillin? Clindamycin could be chosen for patients with a documented history of penicillin or cephalosporin allergy. In certain geographic areas, group A, streptococci macrolide resistance approaches 15% to 20%, decreasing the potential value of this agent. Clindamycin is superior to macrolides with respect to group A, streptococcal coverage, however, it causes diarrhea in 20% of patients and is one of the main agents responsible for antibiotic-associated colitis. Moxifloxacin and levofloxacin are potential alternatives that have the convenience of once daily dosing. The next question reads, what dose should be prescribed for NDP? A recommended dosage of dicloxacillin is 500 mg orally every 6 hours. The dosage for penicillin V is 250 to 500 mg orally every 6 hours. For oral clindamycin, the dosage is 300 to 450 mg every 6 hours. Because dicloxacillin is the drug chosen for NDP, a dosage of 500 mg orally every 6 hours is appropriate. The dose for doxycycline is 100 mg orally every 12 hours, and the dose for trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is 1 to 2 double strength tablets orally every 12 hours. The recommended dose for moxifloxacin is 400 mg orally every 24 hours and 500 mg orally every 24 hours for levofloxacin. The next question reads, what is the appropriate duration of therapy for NDP? Although the recommended duration of therapy for cellulitis is five days, treatment may be extended if clinical improvement is not seen. A reasonable recommendation to the patient would be to continue oral antibiotics for two to three days after the patient has become a febrile and has clinically improved. NDP should be counseled to expect a response within one to two days after therapy begins, although erythema may persist longer. In addition, she should be instructed to return for re-evaluation if the condition does not improve or worsens during the next few days. The next question reads, what further diagnostic evaluation should be undertaken for NDP? In otherwise healthy individuals, identification of the causative organism in cases of mild cellulitis is unnecessary. Needle aspiration, fine needle aspiration biopsy, and punch biopsy identify the causative organism in only 20% to 30% of patients. 
Appropriate empiric treatment is effective in most patients, and an attempt to isolate the organism does not improve success of treatment and adds significantly to the cost of care. However, patients with moderate to severe purulent infection, patients who failed initial empiric therapy, immunocompromised patients, patients with potential joint or tendon damage, or patients with life-threatening infections requiring hospitalization may benefit from additional cultures. In these cases, a swab of the primary wound and a needle aspiration or punch biopsy of the leading edge of the cellulitis should be obtained for gram stain and culture before initiating antimicrobial therapy. Blood and wound cultures should be drawn in these patients. Anaerobic cultures need to be drawn only when the wound contains necrotic tissue, the wound is foul-smelling, or crepitus is present. Even if wound and blood cultures are obtained, many infections will be culture negative, that is 74%. Blood culture results are positive in less than 5% of cellulitis cases. Culture information, in conjunction with clinical course, can be used to modify subsequent treatment. Because NDP has only a mild cellulitis, cultures are not required and therapy should be given empirically. In addition to systemic therapy, NDP should be instructed to keep the area clean with soap and water, if an open wound is present, and to protect the area. Treatment of cellulitis should also include rest, immobilization and elevation of the infected area, and surgical drainage or debridement, as required. The wound should be assessed daily for local tenderness, pain, erythema, swelling, ulceration, necrosis, and wound drainage. The next question reads, could topical antibiotics be used to treat NDP's cellulitis? The value of topical antibiotics in treating skin infections is questionable. Most topical antibiotics have not been evaluated in appropriately designed trials. Although mapiacin is superior to placebo in treating some types of wound infections, its value in more severe disease is uncertain. In patients with moderate to severe infections, mapiacin, or any topical antibiotics, such as neomycin, bacitracin, and polymyxin B, should not be used to replace or augment systemic antibiotics. Topical antibiotics likely do little but add to the cost of therapy, and they occasionally cause a contact dermatitis. Therefore, NDP should not be treated with topical antibiotics because her cellulitis should be managed adequately by her systemic antimicrobial therapy. The next question reads, OKA, a 49-year-old man, presents to the emergency department with a three- to four-day history of increasing pain around his left hip, secondary to an injury he received falling on the sidewalk. In addition, he has a fever and feels weak, lethargic, and nauseated. Examination reveals a swollen, warm, and extremely tender hip. OKA has a temperature of 39.8 degrees Celsius and appears quite ill. A diagnosis of moderate to severe cellulitis is made, and OKA is hospitalized because of the severity of the infection. OKA has no other underlying medical problems. What empiric antibiotic regimen would be reasonable for OKA? In moderate to severe ill patients, when hospitalization is required, antibiotics should be administered parenterally. The parenteral agent of choice is nafciline or oxycillin. Cefazolin, 1 to 2 grams IV every 8 hours would be an appropriate alternative if it is less expensive than nafciline. Second and third generation cephalosporins, cefuroxime, cefoxetine, ceftriaxone, cefotaxime, and some quinolones may be as effective as nafciline, but provide no clinical advantages for most cellulitis. Patients with risk factors for MRSA, such as penetrating trauma, history of MRSA, nasal colonization, IV drug abuse, or the presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, should be treated with vancomycin or agents with activity against streptococci and MRSA. 
One potential option is linozolid, but is limited by potential for drug interactions with serotonergic agents. Other agents include daptomycin, telavancin, dalbavancin, aritavancin, and ceftaroline. Although these agents are as effective in severe cellulitis, they are not used as commonly as vancomycin because of cost and formulary availability. Therefore, OKA should receive either nafciline, oxacillin, or cefazolin, whichever is less expensive and more tolerable for the patient. Once OKA has become a febrile and has evidence of clinical improvement, the parenteral antibiotic should be discontinued and appropriate oral therapy should be initiated to complete at least a five-day course, or until clinical improvement. The next question reads, two days after starting therapy, OKA develops a maculopapular skin rash. What alternative therapy should be chosen? Regardless of when during the course of therapy a drug rash occurs, early or late, the precipitant drug should be discontinued because there is a chance, although small, that the reaction could worsen. In patients who have a penicillin allergy and who still require parenteral therapy, clindamycin, vancomycin, linozolid, moxifloxacin, or levofloxacin could be chosen. Because all of these agents are equally effective, the choice should be based on cost and dosing convenience and presence of risk factors for MRSA. The next question reads, after 48 hours of therapy, culture and sensitivity results are available. What changes, if any, should be made in OKA's treatment? If cultures show only Streptococcus species in a patient who is not allergic to penicillin, therapy should be de-escalated to penicillin because it is effective, well tolerated, and less expensive than nafciline. If cultures grow Staphylococcus species, such as Staphylococcus aureus, that are sensitive to methicillin or oxacillin, the initial empiric therapy should be continued. If the organisms are resistant to methicillin or oxacillin, therapy should be switched to vancomycin 15 mg per kilogram IV every 12 hours or alternative agent as previously described. Because OKA has a presumed penicillin allergy, due to maculopapular rash, and does not require therapy for MRSA, he should continue with clindamycin or vancomycin. Cefazolin may also be an option for penicillin-allergic patients who do not experience severe allergic reactions, such as urticaria and anaphylaxis. The next question reads, after 72 hours of therapy, OKA has improved considerably and has been a febrile for 24 hours. Can he be switched to oral therapy? Once OKA has been a febrile for at least 24 hours and is significantly improved, he can be switched to oral therapy, if tolerated. Clinicians should select the oral agent on the basis of 1. Culture results, if available. 2. Anticipated pathogens, if there are no culture results. 3. Convenience, and 4. Cost. The next question reads, what is the role of anti-inflammatory agents as adjunctive treatment of cellulitis? Anti-inflammatory agents, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents and corticosteroids, have been shown to decrease time to resolution of cellulitis when given in conjunction with antibiotics to patients without diabetes mellitus. Although supporting evidence is weak, a significantly quicker resolution of symptoms in patients on prednisolone 5 to 30 mg per day has been seen. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video.
On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 271.